I'm a, I'm a geostatistician and I work with ISRIC, of course, and I, but I also work with uh, Wageningen University. So I'm, my background is really in, in statistics and applied mathematics. Of course, I make use of R, but I'm not an IT specialist. So like this morning, Tom showed you lots of things. I think he also may said, like, I'm going to show you magic. Hey, he showed this, uh, uh, the uh, auto predict function, and you could see what really great things you can do with the GSAF tools. But of course, you also want to know a little bit about, okay, what's, the, what's behind that? So my goal of this morning and this afternoon, you will be doing a practical using the things that I will be presenting this morning, is to show you what is the statistical background. So what are the fundamental, the basics of the geostatistics that we use when we do soil mapping? And that's what I'm going to talk about. So it's really going back a little bit. Uh, nothing fancy, really, just doing the basics. And I know that for some of you, because I know, I know some people here, it will be a bit of a repetition what you already know. But I think that that's okay. And that's for many of you, maybe it's also something that is quite new. So what's the, the plan of this morning? Well, we're going to have a lecture on, first of all, we're going to explore spatial variation. What is it? And how can we model spatial variation? How can we quantify spatial variation with a tool known from geostatistics, which is known as the semi-variogram? So I hope that some of you have, most of you have heard of that, but even if you never heard about semi-variogram, you still should still be okay. And then we're going to learn how can we estimate that semi-variogram, which is a measure of the spatial variation of a soil property in a region of interest. How can we estimate that semi-variogram from point observations that we took in the field? And uh, why are we going to do that? Well, to know the semi-variogram is quite interesting in itself because it tells you something about the spatial variability, uh, how does it really vary my uh, soil property of interest, like soil texture, organic carbon, whatever variable you're interested in. But it's also a very useful tool to help uh, doing the spatial interpolation with a geostatistical technique known as, as Krieging. So we're going also to talk about Krieging, which is just geostatistical interpolation. How can I create a map, uh, sorry, how can I create a map from just point observations? And we're actually going to even to extend this Krieging, ordinary Krieging is the most basic form of Krieging, to what is known as regression Krieging. And in regression Krieging, the information that we have available to map our map is not just the point observations of our soil property of interest at some finite number of locations in the study area, but in addition we have what we call these covariates, these explanatory variables, like uh, digital elevation model, uh, remote sensing maps, to uh, sort of assist to improve the mapping. So all of that is what we're going to do. Uh, tomorrow, there is much more focus on this regression. So you will have a module tomorrow where the regression is like really deepened out, is, is much addressed much more uh, thoroughly. And then in the afternoon, the computer practical, we do all of the above, but then using a real world uh, case study. So you will get the, also the R scripts, everything will be made available to you so that you can do it all yourself and also would be uh, able to do it uh, with your own data set, uh, with, of course, some additions and modifications. Uh, we will also do a spatial stochastic simulation, but I'm not going to explain this morning, we don't have enough time for that, to explain this morning what that really is about, but you're going to play a little bit with it, and you're going to un maybe get some idea of what it is, but on Wednesday you will get me again when we talk about uncertainty quantification and uncertainty propagation, and then I will also explain you the theory behind spatial stochastic simulation. But I think uh, this, uh, this, this spatial variation, the variogram, the Krieging, uh, that's quite a lot already to cover in, in just one and a half hour. Okay. I think we will have somewhere along the line uh, like a five minute break, so that for those of you who need uh, to go to the bathroom or whatever, or just to have a short break, but basically we have now a, a one and a half hour session. Okay, and not much IT, really about the basics of the geostatistics that is underlying the really fancy, nice map making that Tom already, uh, already illustrated you this, this morning. Okay, that's the plan. So let's start with uh, spatial variation. 
Well, I think uh, we all know, I don't, there's nothing new when I tell you that we know that soil properties, soil varies in space. It's not a constant. It's really one location you have different values uh, of the soil than at other locations. This is just some illustration of that. So the soil is heterogeneous. So can we quantify that spatial variation of soil? Well, in, in geostatistics we use this what is called the semivariance, eh? and uh, I will come in a minute to the semivariogram. So let's look, what, what is the semivariance? What we do is, uh, okay, we have a soil property of interest, uh, let's call it Z. Uh, Z could be, uh, so Z is the soil property. Let's say uh, the clay content, for example. Can you all read this, more or less? Okay, I will not be using it a lot, but maybe once in a while. So I'll do my best. A better one, perhaps. Okay, yeah. So Z is our soil property of interest, and and then we have a study area. I don't know. Uh, and we have measured Z at one location. Let's call that location X. So we have Z. Just let me check if this is uh, can be wiped out. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Otherwise, we would, we would be in trouble after a few minutes. So we have, this is our study area. There's a location X where we have measured the clay content. And there's another location, X plus H. And we also measured our soil property. And so the distance between the two locations is the distance vector, h. So the semivariance is about spatial variation. How, much does, how, how large is the spatial variation as a function of the distance between two locations? So, yeah, we need to explore this, this, this equation for, for a while, okay? That's what we're starting to do right now. So we have our zo soil property of interest, let it be the clay content of the soil. We can measure it at location x, we can measure it at location x plus h, so that's a distance separation, distance h meters or h kilometers apart. And we're going to look at the difference between the two, because we're going to subtract the one from the other. And we don't want uh, positive and negative differences to cancel out, and that's why we take the square of that difference. And we're interested in what does that give us on average? That's why the letter E over here is from mathematics, is expected value. So expected value means what would you get on average if you repeat a probability experiment many, many times? Like when I'm throwing the dice, for example. When I throw a die, I can get any outcome, number between 1 and 6. So the expected value of a throw with a die, well, what, what would that be? Anybody has an idea? Sorry? Uh, <laughs> point six. <laughs> so I'm throwing this die, I'm getting an outcome, maybe 3, maybe 5, maybe 1. I'm going to repeat it. I'm going to do it, let's say, 100,000 times. And I'm adding up all the results and divide by 100,000. What does that give me on average? That's what expected value is about. Well, in the case of a throw with a die, it will be 3.5. You can do the experiment. It's just adding up the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and taking the average of those because they all have equal probability. So that's also how you should interpret this E over here. It's the expected value. What do you get on average when I calculate what is between the square brackets? And that's, okay, then there is a tradition in geostatistics to put a half in front of that. that that's, uh, that's, we can accept that. And then the result is the semivariance. And the semi it's always the letter gamma. So we use this Greek letter gamma. That's the semivariance, and it will be a function of the separation distance between the two locations. 
And, well, then the next question, of course, is uh, if it's a function of the separation distance, uh, how will it look like, okay? So if we make a plot, uh, <coughs> sorry, if, if we could calculate that semivariance for every value of h, eh, and of course I mentioned later on we will discuss how can we calculate that sim, how can we estimate it from point observation, that's one of the next steps. But suppose we could do that, so then uh, an interesting question would be, okay, how would that graph of this semivariance as a function of the distance, so the x-axis here is the h, the y-axis is the gamma, how would that graph look like? So think about that. What do you think it would be? And remember the formula was like this. So we have z at one location, z at the other location, we take the square of the difference. And I think most of you will agree that if the distance becomes larger between two locations, the soil property, the, the difference between the soil property will also increase, right? So you expect an increasing function. The larger the distance, the larger the semivariance. And indeed that is what we see usually in practice. And if I ask people who are completely ignorant about geostatistics, they think it's going to be some kind of yeah, quadratic curve. Uh, because there's a square in that formula. But the practice shows, when we do estimate the semivariance from real-world data, that actually the graph looks a little bit different. I'm going to show you the typical semivariogram that we get. Um, and it looks like this. Okay? So indeed, it is an increasing function. The larger the distance between two locations, the larger on average, eh, expected value, on average we see is the difference between the soil property at those two locations. But there is a point at which actually the function stabilizes and doesn't really increase anymore. And that's uh, because at that point, at that distance, there is no more spatial correlation. You can imagine that the, the soil clay content of the soil has a spatial correlation. When two locations are nearby, the soil clay content is very, they are very similar, so the correlation is, is big, let's say 0 0.8 or whatever. But when the distance then increases, the correlation de decreases and becomes zero at some point. Well, that happens at the distance which we call, that's also again geostatistical jargon, the range. So the range of this semivariogram that signifies the distance up to which there is still spatial correlation. So suppose this would be uh, 500 meters, then it really doesn't matter if the two locations are 500 meters apart or 800 meters apart or two kilometers apart, there is no spatial correlation anymore. The correlation is zero. And then that means that also this semivariance is like a constant. So the semivariogram typically looks like this. It's an increasing function, but at some point, which is called the range, it doesn't increase anymore. This is the point at which there is still spatial correlation beyond the range. Uh, the semivariance is, is a constant. The value that you get at this location, because you get numbers over here, of course, so the value, the maximum value of the semivariogram is called the sill. And the seal is actually equal to the variance of your data set. So, you know, if I would give you a data set with all the clay content observations in that study area, you can calculate the mean clay content, uh, the average, but you can also calculate the variance. I hope you're familiar with that concept. It's a measure of the variation between the observations. Well, the variance of that data set will be quite similar to the seal of the semivariogram. Actually, that's the reason why they, put, uh, they had put this half, oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. They had put this half in front of here, because, because of this half, the sill of the semivariogram is equal to the variance. If there would be no half, the sill of the semivariogram would be twice the variance. But, okay, you can forget about this. So, what do we have? We have uh, a semivariogram typically looks like this. 
uh, the range signifies the distance up to which there is still spatial correlation. The sill is the maximum value of the semivariance, which is quite equal to the variance of your data set, of your data. And then there's a third thing, it's called the nugget. Again, a geostatistical jargon. And actually, that's quite nice because this shows that geostatistics, I didn't mention to you, is that it has its roots. The history of geostatistics goes back to the mining. So in the 1950s, uh, people like mining engineers in South Africa, for example, they were exploring methods to quantify spatial variation and to make maps because they were drilling for, for gold or for really precious metals. And they could not afford, I mean, every drill is very expensive. So they have to get the maximum out of the ob observations that they could take in that area. And so they were really into geostatistics. And the nugget, well, it, it, it actually, yeah, mm, what, what does it really mean? It means that this function, this semi-variogram function, doesn't really start in the origin. That's maybe also something we would have expected, maybe, if we go back to the formula, that when h is very small, okay, two locations really n close to each other, the soil property at one location, the soil property really nearby, you would expect them to be the same. Well, the reality shows that often they are not. Even at a very short distance, already the semivariance is, is, a, is a positive number, bigger than zero. And that's called the nugget, because like I said in mining, if you're looking for gold, there are these things like gold nuggets, right? At, at some locations you have this extremely high concentration of gold, but right next to it there is no gold. It's a nugget of gold, so at very short distance you have a big variation. You can be either in the gold nugget or outside. So that is why this is called nugget, it's like the short distance spatial variation. And it's going to be really important for us as well when we want to make a map, when we want to do this Krieging interpolation that we will do uh, later uh, this morning because it tells me something about how strong is the spatial correlation at short distances, right? And the, the, the stronger the spatial correlation, the more important an observation will be. But we'll see that in a minute. Okay, so these are the definitions of these three parameters of a semivariogram. Okay, I showed you this semivariogram usually looks like this. There are cases where it is a little bit different, but this is the typical shape. And the typical shape has three parameters, the nugget, the sill, and the range. And I tried to explain to you what these three parameters mean. I mentioned that the nugget is the short distance spatial variation, right? But actually random measurement errors are also included. In, in the nugget. So, uh, we were give, look, looking at the example of clay content. Well, if you take a soil sample at this location and a soil sample next, right next to it, and you take it to the laboratory and you measure the clay content, even if the true clay content at those two locations would be the same, if in the laboratory small errors are made because our instrument is, has not like a perfect precision, right? So there is some uh, impreciseness so, uh, or, or in, in the measurement method, then maybe the measured clay content from the one soil sample would still be different from the measured clay content at the other, so from the other soil sample, simply because of the measurement errors. And that will also show up in this nugget. So the nugget is really the combined effect of random measurement errors in the field or in the lab and the short distance spatial variation. So this, this semi-variogram is like a key instrument of geostatistics. It quantifies the degree of spatial variation. It's really important that, uh, that we, we have a good idea of what this semi-variogram tells us. And that's why I want to show you four realities well, I call them possible realities because actually uh, they are synthetic. I created them uh, using some geostatistical technique. Actually, I created them using this spatial stochastic simulation. 
Okay, I know I'm going to I'm giving you a lot of information, but I did mention it earlier that this is what we're going to do this afternoon as well, and on Wednesday we will be talking much more about that. So I created these possible realities with uh, with a geostatistical uh, technique. And I'm going to show you the semi-variogram that corresponds with that reality. And I'm going to show you four different realities. And for us it's important that we can recognize how a different reality matches with a different semi-variogram. So let's look at this, uh, this first reality. It has this semi-variogram. Okay. Uh, <laughs> ah, the nugget is zero, right? Apparently, that means at very short distances, the soil property or that reality is very similar. Okay, I, I do see some sharp boundaries, green turning into yellow, but that's only because I used a finite number of colors in my legend. So in reality, it's really a smooth map changing values. And it has a quite a large range, right? I don't know, like this about. so the distance up to which there is still spatial correlation is quite large, and that's because the patches of similar values are quite large. There are large areas with similar values, so there's a lot of spatial correlation. And let's look at the next reality. It's different from the one that I showed you just before, right? What's the difference? Yeah. Yeah, the patches are smaller. So this one had big patches, large range. This one, the patches are smaller, so that the spatial correlation doesn't reach that far. The range will be smaller. Okay, you can tell from this that the range is smaller than from the other one, just by looking at that possible reality. What about this one? Another reality that I had generated. What is the semi-variogram of this reality? Pure nugget. Pure nugget. Ah, you, uh, you have a background, right? <laughs> yeah. What I see is like noise, right? Uh, white noise, whatever you want to call it. So at short distances, neighboring pixels can al already be completely different value. So there is no spatial correlation. The variogram is just a horizontal line. And uh, indeed, that's what they call the pure nugget semi-variogram. So if, if your reality that you want to map is like this, you're in trouble, right? <laughs> Maybe when we talk about this Krieging later on, we will discuss what would be the best prediction at any location where you didn't take an observation. Maybe you can think about that already now, but it, it will have an effect. So this is what they call the pure nugget. No spatial correlation at all. And then I have a final one, this one. What, 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 what do we have here? There is noise, right? Noise means nugget is not zero. But there is more than noise, there is also some yeah, large scale, big patches structure. It's like a combination of the two. So there definitely is a large range, but the nugget is not zero because there's noise on top of that. So the variogram, the semi-variogram will look like this. So there is this large scale structure, it's just that it doesn't start at the origin, but it starts higher than that. Okay, so just going quickly back, so we had our first one was this one, there was no noise, really strong spatial correlation at short distances, so the nugget is zero, the patches were large, so the range is large. And then the second one, still it didn't have any noise, but the patches were smaller, the degree, the, 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 the range of spatial correlation was shorter, so we had a shorter range. And then we had the pure nugget case, there's no spatial correlation at all, and this was like a combined effect of a structure with a large spatial correlation, large range, but on top of that noise. So when I teach geostatistics to my students here at Wageningen University, I always tell them it's really important that you can make 
you can, from here you can go here and from here you can go here. That you have an idea about if I give you a semivariogram, okay, that tells me that the reality looks a bit like that. How much noise there is, whether there is strong spatial correlation, yes or no, and so on. And if I give you a possible reality, and uh, that could be also exam questions, that I give them some reality, tell which variogram corresponds with which reality. That you can tell from this reality, yeah, there is noise, definitely, so there is a nugget. But there is an underlying large-scale spatial structure, so the range is large as well. Okay, good. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, here are the all four. And uh, which one of these four has the strongest spatial correlation? It will be this one, right? Which one has the lowest? Well, it will be this one, no disagreement. Uh, and what, what about these two? Uh, well, this is a bit mixed, right? Because this one does have a structure with a large range, but there's noise on top. This one doesn't have any noise, but the range is small. So the two variograms, one looked like this, and the other one, I have more colors, looked like this. So uh, it's hard to tell which one has more spatial correlation, huh? because one has, okay, this is a good one, the black one, because it has zero nugget strong spatial correlation, but it doesn't really reach that far. The green one has a much larger range, so it has correlation at larger distances. So if you ask me which of the two has the strongest spatial correlation, this one or that one, I wouldn't be able to, to tell you which one of that is. That really depends. Because there is literature in geostatistics which says you can tell the degree of spatial correlation by calculating the nugget to sill ratio. It's often used, nugget to sill ratio. So that's just the nugget divided by the sill. If it is 0 0.2 or smaller, strong spatial correlation. If it's 0 0.6 or higher, weak spatial correlation. These are like the rules of thumb. But of course, that is not the complete answer because it also depends on the range that you have. Okay. Now, we sort of assume that the semivariance only depends on the distance between two locations. And I, I a little bit fooled you there, because in reality that might not be very realistic. Huh? Um, it, it was defined, you remember that equation that I showed you in the beginning, as z at location x minus z at location x plus h. So there was an x there too. I, I now I use these two locations over here, but I could also have used these two locations. And maybe they have the same distance, it's like, uh, let's say, 400 meters between the two locations. And I sort of assumed that it really doesn't matter whether I'm here or here, the semivariance is only uh, a function of the distance between the two locations. And that's called the stationarity assumption. And we will, in our course, I mean, we, it's like a crash course, we're only doing the basics today, we will assume that the stationarity assumption is valid. Um, this is like the stationarity of the semivariogram, right, of the, the, the variance. The, uh, there is also this uh, issue about the stationarity of the mean of your variable. And when we will talk, be talking later on, on uh, about regression kriging, then actually you are relaxing this assumption. You do no longer assume a constant mean. But I will talk about that, that later. So the stationarity assumption, why do we need it in geostatistics? Because our next step is to aim to estimate the semivariogram from point observations. And if we have a completely free semivariogram, which depends not only on h, but also on x, we would have too many degrees of freedom. We would never be able to estimate it from the observations that we have. So we have to make some kind of restric restrictive assumptions. And the stationarity assumption is often made, but it's good to be aware of that, that we make this assumption, right? Because may it may not be very realistic. Maybe, uh, let's say, this area that I showed you is uh, maybe divided into two parts. This could be the forest, and this could be arable land, I don't know. And if I look at clay content, or maybe organic matter, or pH of the soil, 
I don't know if the semi variogram here is the same as here. So maybe I want to split my study area into two parts. Okay, and then maybe there is a deciduous forest and a, and a coniferous forest, and so you can go on forever, refine your model. Uh, well, that's always a trade-off between how simple is your model, uh, or better make it more complex, but then you need more data to estimate the parameters of that model. We we're not going into that, but it's good to be aware of it. And it's, so we said it's a function of the distance, and I also assume that the distance is a scalar, it's a one numerical value, 400 meters, 500 meters, whatever. I didn't care whether I was going north to south or east to west, so the direction didn't matter. That's called the isotropy assumption. You can relax that too, and maybe this week we will be talking about what they call anisotropy. So that's the opposite of isotropy, that the direction does matter. And if there would be, uh, okay, if there would, for example, be a river over here. I'm not a soil scientist, but I do know that clay content of the soil <laughs> uh, perpendicular to the river is quite different from parallel to the river. Like the further away, the coarser the material. So definitely, if this would be the reality, then it would matter the direction that I take. So there would be anisotropy. But we're taking it easy, we're assuming stationarity and isotropy. So the semi-variogram is only a function of the Euclidean distance, the one number distance, a scalar. Okay. So now let's go to the next topic. How can we estimate that semi-variogram from observations? And we are going to take an example of uh, the pH of the topsoil. I think it's the A horizon of the soil that was measured for Europe, right? You can recognize Europe. <laughs> and we have, I think, about, let me see, 2,800 observations. 25, it will be in the next slide, 2582 locations where the pH was measured of the topsoil. And what we want to do is to estimate that semi-variogram that characterizes the spatial variation of the pH of the soil for this study area, for this part of Europe. It's always good to take a look at the data. I think uh, that was also mentioned already today. And always check the things, you know, check whether your results make sense. So we can already try, for example, to a little bit hypothesize what the semi-variogram should look like. Uh, I see that in Scandinavia, there's lots of blue, black and purple, so these are the low pH. Well, I guess forested area is, 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 is indeed, uh, pH is low. And then when we go more south, well, I see here a lot of orange, right? <laughs> Even some yellow. So there are larger pH in the south. So, so I, I see that they are clustered to some degrees. There will be spatial correlation, right? It's not that it's like a noise. There is some spatial structure. But I also see that there will be a nugget. Huh? Can you see evidence of nugget? <laughs> So if we're looking for nugget, we really should be looking at two locations, not far from each other, very different soil pH. Oh, look here, black and yellow right next to each other. That's, these are the two extremes. <laughs> Maybe that stationarity assumption, we're only looking at the pH here. And if, if, if Europe is your, st your study area, maybe you would say, you can do much better than that, huh, right? Because we know that the pH of the soil, for example, depends on land cover. Okay, that's what we're going, this is this regression creaking, okay? But let's take it simple now. This is all we've got. We only have this pH, of, well, we have a lot of observations, and we want to quantify the spatial variation with this semi-variogram. So I do see, yeah, also here is black with orange, so definitely in Netherlands too we have orange and black and, and for sure we can explain why, but, but just looking from a geostatistical point of view, I see lots of locations where there's short distance spatial variation. So for sure there, sh there will be a nugget in this semi-variogram, just calculate it straight on the pH data. 
Okay, so, so how can we estimate this semivariogram? Uh, this is done in geostatistics uh, through a process which is known as structural analysis. To estimate the semivariogram from point observations, because that is usually what we have available. We went into the field, we collected data, or maybe crowdsourcing people volunteered data, or maybe our colleagues did that in the past. Anyway, we have point data to start with, and we want now to characterize it with uh, the spatial variation with from these data. So we have, well, we are in a quite a comfortable situation here. We have a lot of data, over 2,500. So what do we do in the structural analysis? Well, for each observation location, we make a pair with every other observation, right? And we can make really many of those. Because if you calculate, I mean, the first location can make a pair with n minus 1 other locations. And then the second location can also make a pair with n minus 1 other locations. One I already included, so let's say n minus 2. And if you add it all up, then you will see that the number of pairs that you can make is half times n times n minus 1. So it's over a million, right, in, in, in this case. M more than 3 million, I think. And every pair, pH here, pH there, gives me a little small piece of information about the spatial variation. Because I can calculate the difference, pH one location minus pH the other location, take the square of that difference, multiply with a half. Well, that's going to estimate the semivariance at that distance, right, between those two locations. And every single pair of points I can do that. I can calculate the squared difference in pH and plot it as a function of the distance. And every, all of them, they give me a little bit of information about the semivariogram. If you make this plot, you will get what is called the semivariogram cloud. And my, the next slide shows you the semivariogram cloud that I calculated on this data set. And it looks like this. Uh, they are all blue pluses. But there are so many of them that this turns completely blue over here, right? So this one on top of the other, or many, many, many. So there's, because we have a th like about three million of those. Uh, so that's really difficult to, 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 to grasp from this what the semivariogram is. Because you also remember the semivariogram was the expected value. What do you get on average? So we need to average those. So the idea in, in geostatistics is, in the structural analysis, to not plot each single pair of points half the square difference, but to group them over what they call lags. So you define lags, these are spatial intervals, like from 0 to 50 kilometer, from 50 to 100, from 100 to 150, or maybe from 100 to 200, whatever you like, you will be doing that this afternoon. Right? You're going to define those lags, spatial intervals. And for every pair, like if the first lag would be from 0 to 100 kilometer, uh, these are, if you can read this, these are meters. So this has 500,000 meters. So 500 kilometers, right? 500 kilometers is this distance. On the European scale, you remember, we're doing Europe. So if this would be the first lag from 0 to 100, so we're going to look in Europe all location, all pairs of locations that have a distance between the two points that is between 0 and 100 kilometers. And for the next leg, all pairs between 100 and 200 and so on. And I'm going to average all those half squared differences between the pH of the two locations that make up this pair and take the average of those. And that's going to be this plus over here. And then you get what they call the experimental semivariogram. Some people also call it the sample semivariogram. Okay, so what do we see? Ah, yeah, it's true what we, what we, what we already anticipated, eh, hypothesized. There is spatial correlation because you see as the distance increases, the semivariance also increases. There is definitely spatial correlation. But there is also a nugget. So at short distances, already quite some spatial variation. And th th we know the reasons for that, right? At the European scale, 50 kilometers is a short distance. 
But 50 kilometers, you can be in a completely different parent material, different land use, and so on. So we expect that pH can differ quite a lot at, at short distances. Okay, so we have this sample variogram. Um, maybe, maybe, yeah, we have, we can also explore a little bit, okay, what do, you, what do these numbers mean over here? Always good also to, uh, to, to think about that. Um, I, I mentioned to you that the, the sill is equal to the variance, right? So. So, well, the, the, the x-axis we know, this is the distance between two locations. And it was in meters, so we have to remove three zeros, and then you get kilometers, so 500, 1,000, 1,500 kilometers. The y-axis, well, the, the definition of the semivariogram, gamma of h, half expected value, set x minus set x plus h square. Well, pH, I don't know what are the units of pH, is the log of, uh, well, <laughs> maybe we could do uh, organic uh, carbon, it would be, uh, let's say, uh, gram per kilogram, or <laughs> I don't know. Then what would be the, the gamma, the semivariate, what would be the measurement unit of that? If, if the Z is gram per kilogram, or maybe, yeah, I can even do a gram per... Uh, a cubic meter, I don't know. Um, well, the gamma, is, this is gram per meter, this is gram per meter, the difference is also gram per meter, but you take the square. So the square, then, so the gamma will be, have as measurement units, the gram per meter square. So be aware of that. When you read these numbers, Interpret them net, not as the same measurement unit. You have to take the square root to go back to the original measurement scale. So, for example, here we can see that the sill, let's say the sill is about 2. And we know that the sill is equal to the variance, right? Uh, I mentioned that. So, the variance is about 2. Yeah, I don't know, I'm, I mean, we're not going to repeat all the basic statistics that you learned uh, maybe a long time ago, but you all, hopefully you remember that standard deviation that's the square root of the variance, so that will be uh, square root of 2, well, that's about 1.4. So the SIL tells me that the variability of the pH in Europe, well, if I make a histogram of all the pH data in Europe, maybe it looks a bit like this. Maybe the idealized world of a normal distribution. <laughs> uh, the mean, I don't know the mean, uh, well, we could check again, but uh, oh, why, let's do that. Uh, well, it was from, from 2.9 till 9.9, so five and a half about, am I, or six and a half. So the mean will be around 6.5. And the standard deviation, it's good that we talk about that now, because these are concepts that we need in geostatistics, and also on Wednesday we'll be talking about that. So the standard deviation will be about 1.4 measure of the spread, of the variability. So the nice thing about this geostatistics is that we're not only looking at mean and, and, and variation, but we're also going to look at variation as a function of distance, right? We're going to look at uh, how does that variation depends, depend on the distance between locations. But the sill was like the variance, the variance, so that would be about two, the square root of that is the, what they call the standard deviation. It's a measure of the spread. Okay. <laughs> so uh, now, in this case, because these numbers are like from, from, from 0 to 2, whether you take a square or, or a square root, doesn't really matter that much. 
But if you're dealing with data, I think uh, yeah, that this afternoon you will be dealing with uh, pollution of the soil. Uh, then the numbers of the measured variable is like 100 or 150 or 300. Well, then if you take a square, you get to 90,000, right? Or so then these numbers become really very different. But always be aware that the measurement units of these are the square of the measurement units of the original variable. OK, we have our sample variogram. Um, now what we need, we, we, don't, we, we need it to fit a function. We need, we, because for the Krieging, the, the, the spatial interpolation that we will be talking about later, we need to know this gamma, this semivariance, for every distance h. So we really need to fit some kind of curve. Oh, by the way, yeah, I forgot to mention that, uh, I don't know if you can read, but for example, here it says 78,764. These are the number of pairs of points that have been merged, averaged, to calculate the single plus over here. And here we had even 137,000 something. Okay, so you can plot also, these graphs I've made with the GSTAT package in R, and you will be using that also this afternoon. So you can not only plot these sample semivariable values, these experimental semivariable values, but you can also plot the number of pairs that have been used to calculate it, which, which gives you some confidence. I mean, we are really, we're in a fortunate situation that we had over 2,500 observations. But if you have only 100 observations, then those pairs will, be, of course, be much smaller. So we want to fit a function. I'm going fast, but I hope you can, you, you can follow, right? And it's, uh, well, almost time for, for a short break, but I would like to finish this part, this, this semi-variogram estimation, and then we'll go for a, for a five-minute break before we do the interpolation. So when you fit a function through that sample experimental variogram, the problem is you cannot choose any function you like. Okay, that, that is uh, unfortunate, but uh, you have to use a function, what they call, which is semi-positive definite. It's a statistical thing, but it's really, and I'm not going to explain that to you, but you, you cannot choose any function you like. You have to prove that it is a valid function, because it is about characterizing the spatial variation, and semi-variance can ne cannot be negative, and all these kind of, you can have, uh, c get into trouble if you just fit any function you like. So you have to prove that the function is valid, as they call it. And for these functions, the spherical, the exponential, the linear, the Gaussian, it has been shown that they are valid. So the recommendation is choose one of the existing functions. And there are more than these, right? So you're not confined to only these four. You can also make combinations I don't know if we will be doing that, but so there's a lot of very um, flexibility there. And here are the formulas for these equations. And you see, uh, well, let's take the exponential. Uh, there is a symbol C0, C0. This is the nugget. It's just a symbol for the nugget. The C is called the sill parameter. Actually, the C is the sill minus the nugget. And the A is the range parameter. It controls the range of the variogram. So th whenever we fit, and, and of H, of course, is like before the distance between two points. If you would plot this function, you would get a shape like this. And this one as well, but it is a little bit different shape. And I, I, I recommend that this afternoon you try them out. OK, uh, in the computer practical. The Gaussian looks very much like the exponential, the, the equation, the mathematical equation, but there is a square over here. And the result of that is that the variogram doesn't look like this, but it looks like this. So it starts horizontal and then... So if your data, if your experimental variogram suggests that this is a better fit than this, then you should use this, right? Things like that, so, but you will be playing with that this afternoon. So you choose or you try out several shape functions, you estimate the parameters, we'll come to that in a minute, and then of course you estimate them in a way such that you get a, the best fit through this experimental 
variogram. For example, you can use uh, weighted least squares fitting. I, I guess you're familiar with that from regression. Like you have this uh, uh, x and y, you have points, and you fit a line such that the, dif the distance between the line and the ob observed values Maybe I'll plot it, I'll make a drawing just to make sure. <laughs> uh, let me do that for the variogram. Right, so we have the distance, we have the gamma, we had these blue pluses. So we're going to fit a curve now. We choose a function or we try out several. And we're going to fit it in such a way that these distances are as small as possible. So from, uh, I think you all agree that the red line is a much better fit and th then this green line, right? And the criterion is simply you, you go from the line to the observed value to the blue plus, you take that distance, you take the square of that, you add it all up and you try to get that number as small as possible, that criterion, using least squares fitting. And maybe, yeah, here it says weighted, because you remember we had this number of point pairs. Maybe you can use that because a, a plus with a lot of point pairs is more reliable than a plus with a few, so maybe you would like to use that somehow in, in, in a weighting. So uh, you can play with that if you have time also this afternoon because lots of different weight, weighting schemes that you can use. Okay, so what I got for the pH data of the soil of Europe is this fitted curve. I'm quite happy with that. It looks pretty good, uh, especially here it does a really good job fitting and we will see after the short break that we will have in a minute that this part of the semivariogram is really important when you do the spatial interpolation. That's, you want to get it right there. Well, that you m mess up a little bit here, that, that, that's okay. Uh, maybe, maybe you notice that there's a bit of a dip over here. Uh, you can model that in geostatistics, but it would s if you model that, it would suggest Okay, that spatial correlation at this distance, 1,300 kilometers, is stronger than at 1,000 kilometers. I'm not sure if that makes sense for Europe, right? So you always have to be careful when you make these kind of decisions, does it make sense? It's actually not so easy to come up, up with examples where you have sort of a periodicity in your semivariogram. You can come up with them, but I don't think it makes much sense here, so I'm quite happy with, with this semivariogram. And what do we see? Range is 800 kilometers, so there's definitely spatial correlation. The nugget to sill ratio is about one third. Yeah, so, mm, okay, quite some short distance spatial variation. Okay, let's have uh, like a five minute break and then continue with, uh, with the creaking. Unless there are questions about this part. Yeah. Ah, yeah, 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 that's a very good question. <laughs> you, normally when I, when I teach this, I take uh, two or three lectures just to explain all that we did now in, in, in 50 minutes. But one choice you have to make is how do, to choose the lag size, right? Uh, the, these intervals. Um, there are some rules of thumb, okay? There's not one perfect solution. The rules of thumb are that you want to have at least 10 lags. If you make too few, then you, don't, you lose this resolution, let's say. You know. But you also want to guarantee that you have enough point pairs per lag. So in this example, no problem whatsoever, but if you only have uh, 80 observations, you can run into trouble. Uh, and uh, so, so then that, that tells you that you can't make the legs too small. Because if you make them smaller, you get fewer point pairs, right? So you have to make them big enough so that you have at least, uh, rule of thumb, at least 30 pairs per leg, point pairs per leg. Um, the, another, the, the third rule of thumb is don't calculate 
the semi-variogram uh, for the like the maximum distance between points possible. So the, the maximum lag should be what they say half the diagonal of your study area. So if this is your study area, then the maximum distance up to which you still, still, still should make these comparisons is half the diagonal. So like, like this distance. Uh, I mean, there are there is an observation over here. There is one here. I can make a pair between these two. I could calculate the sample semivariance for this distance, this really large distance, but it would not be a representative, let's say, value for the, the semivariance for the study area, because, for example, any point that is in the center of the study area cannot make a pair with another point, because this distance means that I'm outside the study area, right? So it would be very biased towards observations that are at the boundary of the study area. So don't make your largest lag size as large as can be, but use like maximum distance, half the diagonal of the study area. Uh, in the practical this afternoon, the GSTAT software makes like default choices. The default choices are the ones that I just mentioned, like 10 or 12 lags, or maybe 15, uh, maximum half the diagonal or one third of the uh, bounding box I think it's using. And uh, that, that, that's, that's what are the default choices. But you can in the software, I'm not sure if it is part of the exercises, but you can, the parameter width uh, controls the lag size. You can play with it. There's plenty of time this afternoon and cut off is the maximum distance. You can also, which I usually recommend, use small legs at the short distances and make them larger as you go further at larger distances. You can imagine that from zero to 100 kilometers, well, let's say two points that are 10 kilometers apart and two points that are 90 kilometers apart, they are quite different eh, from 10 to 90. From 810 to 890, it's not relatively not such a big difference. So it may make sense to, to remedy this, to solve this, to use sm shorter lags at short distances. But really to figure out what, because we, you remember this was like 80,000 pairs of points. I should maybe like to see what happens here. I mean, I extrapolated this function in a way. But maybe in reality it more goes like that or li like that, I don't know. So you could investigate that. Okay, so there are rules of thumb that tell you how to choose the lag sizes, but there is no best way. Actually, if you, from a statistical point of view, if you want to do it the best, maybe the best way is to use maximum likelihood estimation of the variogram. It's not part of what we will be discussing today, and maybe it will not even, I'm not sure if we will talk about it in the course. No, Bas is saying no. <laughs> so if you want to know more about that, then we can provide you with the literature. Okay. Any other questions? That's good because we... Uh, we okay, so Krieging, the next topic, the spatial interpolation. I, I mentioned this 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 uh, history the, of of geostatistics that it has the, its roots in mining. So there was this mining engineer Daniel Krieger. Uh, he he came up with this spatial interpolation technique, and that's why it's called Krieging. Uh, and there's lots of different ways of Krieging, eh? but the most simple one, the basic one, is called uh, ordinary Krieging. So we will only look now at ordinary Krieging. And then we will also look at a, a little bit more advanced method because it's being used a lot, especially in digital soil mapping. We make a lot of use of regression creaking. So we have to talk about that as well. And you will be doing that even this afternoon and also in the course of the week. And I think the maps that, that uh, Tom was showing before the coffee break, they basically also were using regression creaking. So what is the idea of creaking? Well, we have our observations. This is our study area. Well, in, in our case it was Europe, but let this be the study area. We have observations. 
and we want to make a map. We want to do spatial interpolation, right? So at any location where we did not measure the soil property, we want to predict, to estimate what it could be. So maybe, for example, over here. We would like to know what is the value of the clay content over here. And if I can do it here at this blue cross, I can do it everywhere. Uh, this point can move in the study area. Usually we would put some kind of fine grid on top of the study area and predict at the centers of all of those grid cells. So for us, let's say we only want to predict over here. If we can do it here, we can do it everywhere. And the idea of Krieging is that we are going to, of ordinary Krieging, is that we're going to use the the only information we have are the observations. We have to deal with those. And uh, there's no additional information. So if we want to predict the value of Z over here of the soil property, well, we have to somehow use the neighboring observations to help us to make that prediction. Okay, so the prediction at a location is going to be some kind of combination of the observations in the neighborhood. Uh, maybe it's on the next slide, but basically what we're going to do is the Z hat. Uh, you are familiar with the hat symbol, meaning estimate or prediction at that location. Let's, it's also custom in geostatistics to call this location X0, X0. So that's the location where we want to make our prediction, where we didn't take an observation. And it has to become some kind of function of the observations. The observations are at location x1, x2, x3, up, up to xn. And in ordinary Krieging, we take a linear combination. I think it's in the next slide. OK, so the prediction, the estimate of the clay content at a location where I did not take a measurement is going to be a linear combination of the observations at location x1, x2, x3, up to xn. Are you are familiar with this no type of notation for summation, I, I hope. Yeah. And then there here there is what they call a weight. It's called the Krieging weight. Because you can imagine that an observation nearby should have carry more weight than an observation far away, or even that one over here. And you can imagine also that the, the weight that you give, the credit, let's say, that you give to an observation, so then the size of the Krieging weight, should depend on the explanatory power, on the correlation, on the spatial correlation. Uh, if there's a strong spatial correlation at short distances, you really find Nearby observations really important. They get a large Krieging weight, much larger than observations that are further away, which are like uh, beyond the range of the semivariogram. So you can imagine that this semivariogram is going to be really important in choosing <coughs> these Krieging weights. I hope you can understand, right? So ordinary Krieging, a linear combination of the observations. Uh, but weighted, so there are weights, and the weights will deri be derived from the degree of spatial correlation from the semivariogram. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> what I wrote over there is, is here on this slide. Okay, so the, the prediction at a location where I didn't take a measurement is going to be a linear combination of the observations but it's a weighted linear combination, not just the average of everything. Some observations get larger weights than other observations simply because they have more information. They are more strongly correlated. Okay, so what, what to do then? How to choose these weights? That, that is really like the big problem now that we have to solve. So how, how can we choose these weights? Mm, let's see. The idea, I will be quick a little bit, is that you need a criterion, right? You need to decide why is this solution better than another solution? And you want to get the best solution. So what you're go really going to look at is the prediction error. This is the Krieging 
prediction error. Predict it minus true. Or you can also say true minus predicted. I don't care. Uh, but <laughs> let's say predicted minus true. That's the error that we make. And we want to this error to be as small as possible. If we could make this prediction error zero, we would have a perfect map. That would be the ideal. Unfortunately, we cannot do that, <laughs> usually, OK? Because we, don't, we have limited information. We don't really know what is the true value at that location where we didn't measure. We can only make a prediction. But with geostatistical theory, you can characterize this prediction error with a probability distribution. So it will have some sort of probability distribution. What we want is that the probability distribution is centered around zero, because then it will be unbiased, right? Not a systematic error, systematically too high or too low. Somebody has an idea what that tells me about the Krieging weights, these lambdas. If I want to make sure that I don't have a systematic overestimation or underestimation of the true value, that that Krieging prediction error has us centered around zero, the probability distribution, well, the way I can achieve that, I, I think it should make sense to you, is by imposing that the Krieging weights sum to one. So that's a condition. The Krieging weights must sum to one. Uh, if they would sum to a number bigger than one, I would have a systematically a too high estimate. If the Krieging weights would sum to, let's say, 0 0.9 or 0 0.8, I would systematically underestimate. So we want to make sure that the Krieging weights add up to one. If you do it like that, you make sure that the prediction error probability distribution is centered around zero. But you have more choice. Eh? You have n parameters that you can choose. So you still have, for example, you can choose between this black one or between this green one or between this blue one. I hope. It makes sense to you that, that you understand what I'm trying to show you. These are probability distributions of the Krieging error. Which one do you like best? The blue, the green, or the black? Green. The green. Good. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad you agree with me. I mean, the narrower, the better, right? Because it would mean that the errors are usually quite small. So the idea of Krieging is to get this probability distribution as narrow as possible while maintaining that it's centered around zero. That's what you do. So the criterion will be to minimize the expected squared difference. That's like the variance, the standard deviation squared of that prediction error under the unbiasedness condition. So that is the starting point of this ordinary Krieging. Using this objective, this criterion, this goal, you can mathematically show what the value of the Krieging weights should be. And they will depend on the variogram. And I will just show you the equations that you need to solve to calculate those Krieging weights. OK, so I'm not, I did not show you how this was derived. It would be much beyond the goals of, of, our, uh, of this morning's lecture. And, um, but you just have to trust me on that. <laughs> Maybe in the, in the literature that I will send you, you there is some, a bit of a derivation. But this is what you have to solve. And you have here, well, we, we, we can spend a few minutes on trying to interpret what we see here. We have this has to be true for all i equal 1 to n. And you remember, n is the number of observation locations. So we actually have here n equations. So for every i, this has to be true. n equations, and here is another equation that also has to be satisfied. So we have n plus 1 equations. 
And how many unknowns do we have? How many parameters? Well, we also have n plus 1 parameters because we have the lambdas, and we have n of those, and we have an additional parameter called the Lagrange parameter. And I, I cannot explain you now how that pops up, but basically it's introduced because when you want to solve these kind of systems, mathematically you want to have as many unknowns, as many parameters as there are uh, equations. So that's why we need this extra parameter. It's like a mathematical trick to solve uh, this. So you, ca you can forget about that. But, but, but just to know that here we now have, in the end, we have n plus 1 equations and n plus 1 unknowns. Maybe you remember from, from secondary school mathematics, if I tell you 3a plus b equals 5, 5a minus 7b equals 20, you can solve a and b, right? <laughs> and you can also do that if uh, you have... Uh, 100 equations with 100 unknowns, but of course you won't do that with pen and paper anymore. Uh, you will use the computer for that. And when I was doing my PhD, uh, this of course is all implemented in geostatistical software. So I'm talking 25 years ago. If n would be like 500 oh, I could, or, or 200, I could take a coffee break, right? But uh, I think <laughs> nowadays, uh, I don't, depending on how powerful your laptops are, but uh, that shouldn't be a problem. It will be a few, few seconds and you have the answer. If n becomes uh, 2,000 or 20,000 or 100,000, okay, then you are talking a little bit uh, different. So what, because the, the lambda, these are the unknowns, but the gammas, they are known. They, this is the semivariogram, right? So we have fitted our semivariogram, we know it. So these are numbers that we know. Uh, and, 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 oh, so this indeed this proves, shows us that the, the, the degree of spatial correlation, the, the, the semivariogram, influences the lambdas that we get. And we need not only the gamma, the semivariance at the distance between observation location and target location, but you also need it between the observation locations. I, if you're familiar with inverse distance interpolation, which they do a lot in GIS, it's only the distance that matters. But in geostatistics, it's not only the distance. Uh, I'll give you one example. Suppose this is my target location. I have an observation here, and I have three observations here. And the distance is the same between observation location and target location. So they are all on, well, this is a circle, okay? <laughs> They're all on a circle. So, that the, so if you do inverse distance interpolation, the weight that each of these gets, number 1, 2, 3, and 4, would all be equal, 1 over 4, right? Well, in Krieging, it will not be like that. A little bit depending on the variogram, but what we typically see is that the one of them is the biggest and one of them is the smallest. So which of the four observations will get the largest Krieging weight? One, correct. Lambda one will be bigger than... Which one will get the smallest? Three, very good. It will be like that, uh, assuming some kind of symmetry here, like these distances are the same. Uh, the reason is that there is some redundancy in the information here. And we have three observations, but they sort of tell the same story. And you don't want to give them 75% of the influence, because they're telling the same story. That's why this one gets a bigger weight, more than 25%. And then three is really the worst because in, it's in between two and four. And so it has, suffers the most from the redundancy. And you can explain that because the gammas between observation locations is included in the calculation of the Krieging weights. Okay. Um, I'm looking at the clock. We have two more minutes. 
But I'm going to take 10 minutes from your break, <laughs> from your lunch break, okay? Because I'd like to finish. Is that okay with you? Okay. So let's, let's apply this ordinary Krieging to our pH data of Europe. This, these were the point data. This was the semivariogram. And then this is the interpolated map. I don't think it's very impressive, but okay. <laughs> it is the result of the ordinary Krieging. And what you see is that where you have low pH in the measurement, you also get a low pH in the predictions. Where you have high values, you get high values in the predictions. You also see that the map is really smooth. And the reality is much more fluctuating. We, you remember uh, yellow and black, where were they? Here, really close to each other. But in the, in the prediction map, it, it's just a continuous surface. Because it really doesn't know whether things go up or down. It goes like the middle road. Um, we'll come back to that also on Wednesday, when we do deal with this spatial stochastic simulation. Okay, and um, the nice thing about Krieging is that it doesn't only give you a prediction, but it also quantifies the prediction error, the interpolation error. So it quantifies, you remember this was our criterion, we want to get this as small as possible. Well, that's called the Krieging variance, the Krieging variance. You get it automatically, freely, as a byproduct of your interpolation. So you not only make your prediction of the pH, but you also quantify how well you did. This spread of that probability distribution, you remember? And that is given by this. So we have calculated the lambdas, we know the gamma, we had this Lagrange parameter, so all of this is known. We can just substitute it in the equation and get the Krieging variance. Now if you study this a little bit, then you, you will see that the semivariogram has also a really strong influence on the, uh, on the Krieging variance. And if you are predicting at a location where you have many observations nearby, the gammas are small, right? Because the distances are small. So this will be small. And therefore, this will be small. If you are predicting at a location where there are no observations nearby, far away, the distances are large, the gamma will be large, the Krieging variance will be large. So this is the map of the Krieging standard deviation, the interpolation error, the measure of the interpolation error for Europe. And you can see, yeah, indeed, we had many observations in Scandinavia. The uncertainty is low. Uh, ah, we have no observation, well, only one in Finland. I don't know, anybody from Finland here? <laughs> Maybe you can provide some data. <laughs> so the uncertainty is very large. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and now, I, I, I took the square root of this Krieging variance. I always recommend to take the square root because then you get the measurement units that you can interpret. So these are, these are pH units, okay? So in, uh, let's say in Madrid, close to Madrid, well, I don't know, what did I predict? I predict a pH of around uh, 6.5, but it is plus or minus. 0.85, it's the measure of the uncertainty, right? So it's uh, about 0.8 to up to 1.5 pH units standard deviation. Okay, uh, regression Krieging. So I mentioned to you the regression will be addressed tomorrow in great detail. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that, I'm only going to look at linear regression, but it is important that we, we talk a little bit about it. So you remember our target variable Z of X, like the clay content of the soil, Z. In, uh, basically, in geostatistics, we, uh, we assume some kind of model of our target variable. We say the Z is a, a statistical model of Z. It's, it's the sum of a trend and a stochastic residual. But that stochastic residual can be spatially correlated. 
and we quantify the spatial correlation of that re stochastic residual, the fluctuation from the trend with the semivariogram. That's what we were talking about all morning so far. But in ordinary, and in ordinary Krieging, we assume that this m is a constant. That was that stationarity assumption, a stationary mean, a constant. The pH in Europe is like a constant, but then some fluctuation around, and with some spatial correlation structure. All our attention this morning, so far, has been focused on the epsilon, the stochastic residual. In regression Krieging, we're going to relax that assumption of stationarity and we're going to allow the trend, the mean, to be no longer constant, but to be a function of explanatory variables. I'm going to show you another example where we modeled the soil depth as a function of a location, so the, s the depth to bedrock. Uh, and doing geostatistics, but not assuming like a constant mean, but let this depend on explanatory variables. And maybe 20 years ago, we didn't have that many explanatory variables, but nowadays we have with the remote sensing, advanced, we have so many high resolution explanatory variables. Maybe that's also the strength of the GSIF uh, package, the GSIF functionality. The G because, which you will see later this week, that we have so many covariates, explanatory variables that are related with our target variables, that we can make use of that information. And here I do it really simplistically, okay? I know that high locations maybe have usually smaller soil, soil depth than low locations. When I'm in the valley, there is more soil material than on the top of the uh, mountain. And maybe the slope angle also, eh? flat terrain, usually maybe more larger soil depth than when a very steep terrain. If there's a lot of vegetation, it catches sediment, okay, large. So there's all reasons why these covariates can explain from a soil science, from a physical perspective, why they help explaining variability in soil depth. That's the idea of regression creaking. You have... A, no, uh, a trend which is no longer a constant. I just, just used here linear regression, but you, Tom mentioned random forests and neural networks, so these are all kinds of techniques, machine learning techniques as they call them, to model such a trend. Okay, we keep it simple here now. And if you would do linear regression, we, I think all of you have done that, you would really focus on this, and the residual, this epsilon, is typically assumed to be independent, no spatial correlation. So regression Krieging sort of combines linear regression with geostatistics. So we have a trend, but we have a residual uh, that has spatial correlation. So traditionally, geostatistics really focuses on modeling this residual, really putting a lot of effort in, in semi-variogram calculation and uh, using that in the Krieging. Regression really c cares only about fitting the trend as good as possible, uh, choosing other interactions, yes or no, putting a lot of effort on that and sort of ignoring that st stochastic residual. Well, now with this regression Krieging, we combine those two worlds. That, that's the idea. Okay. <laughs> Let's uh, possible to work on the covariates and later add the residuals. Yeah, you can do that too. If, uh, yeah, that's so you 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 could uh, and maybe we're doing that. I will show you maybe but so you have to deal with the trend and you have the stochastic residual. You could first fit only the trend and then later do the geostatistics on the residual. I think it will be in the next uh, slides. So, yeah, basically, it's, it's uh, basically here. This is the algorithm that you use when you do this regression creaking. You select your explanatory variables and you fit a regression model. So estimate those betas of the regression model. Or use this random forests or whatever. Then you compute your residuals at the locations where you had observations. So you subtract the fitted trend from the observations and you compute a semi-variogram of the residuals. So the semi-variogram will be different 
from the one you had before on the original data. It's the semivariogram of the residuals. You will be doing that this afternoon. You apply the regression model to predict at every location at the whole grid. Uh, you run your regression model. You interpolate the residuals with Krieging. You add up the two results. As simple as that. OK? So this is an example. This is Croatia in the southeast of Europe, um, uh, Tom's uh, home country. And this is a 50 by 50 square kilometer area where soil depth was measured and a regression creaking was applied using all kinds of covariates. Most of the covariates derived from, your digi from a digital elevation model. And this is what we got. So you have here your original data. The bigger the circle, the larger the soil depth. This is when you do ordinary Krieging, a really smooth map, right? This is when you do only regression. This is when you use only the existing discrete soil map as a predictor. So just say, whenever I need to predict the soil depth, I take the average of all soil depth observations uh, in, uh, that are in the same soil mapping unit, right? So you get these really sharp, discrete boundaries. And then this is the regression Krieging result, which is a bit of a mix of these two. Well, it copies a lot of the regression, you see. But there are different, I see here this black area over here with a white one. It was not really uh, present here, but it is because it is shown also in the data. So it's really the combination of the regression and the Krieging that you do. Uh, the validation showed that the regression Krieging did like had the smallest root mean squared error compared with the three alternative techniques. So, like an, there was an independent validation data set. Okay, it was only 35 observations, not so many, but uh, the, the 35 of it did show that in this case, maybe I don't know if it's uh, universally valid, but the regression Krieging does a better job than just Krieging or just regression. And I think it's also not really surprising because you have more information. Eh? If you compare regression Krieging with ordinary Krieging, in ordinary Krieging we only have our data, our point data. In regression Krieging we also have these covariates, these explanatory variables, and they explain part of the variation. They have an R square bigger than zero, right? Okay, uh, I think the final slide, almost. <laughs> This was the ordinary Krieging of the pH. This is the regression Krieging of the pH. Using land cover, uh, soil type, well, lots of additional covariates. And I, I think this map, anyway, looks nicer than this one. If, is it also better? Maybe we should do a validation or a cross-validation. I, I hope you're familiar with that term to actually show that this map is more accurate, more closer to the reality than this map. Well, this is still simple regression Krieging uh, in 2D, just the topsoil. But, uh, well, Tom already showed this morning with this soilgrids.org. We are actually using these kind of techniques, but really sophisticated regression algorithms, non-linear, doing it for the whole, uh, well, actually the whole world. Uh, but we, we, and maybe we, we should also, this is, I think, the zero to five centimeter, so you can have multiple layers, it's 3D. Uh, th this was the A horizon, so you cannot really compare the maps. But we, well, I mean, we, we could make, actually make a study of how well do this, does this map agree with this map. Well, the legend here, the colors are different. Red means low pH. Blue means high pH, so we have to sort of invert the colors over <coughs> here. I didn't do that, but uh, it could be interesting to show what, uh, like a scatter plot, right? Make a scatter plot, predictions of method A against predictions of method B. You'll learn much, much more about this on, on Thursday, how these maps were made. But maybe more focus on the IT, the software side, and less on the statistical part. Okay, so we're ready. Uh, what did we do? 
this morning. We looked at spatial variation. We learned how to quantify spatial variation with the semivariogram. It's a quantitative measure of spatial variation. We even learned how we can estimate the semivariogram using point data. And we applied it. Uh, you, we used the semivariogram to make maps using ordinary Kriging. And we had a bit of a look at regression Kriging. So this afternoon, you will have the whole afternoon to apply all the above to a real world case study. And you will also do a little bit on spatial stochastic simulation. I did not explain the theory about that, but that we will do on Wednesday. I realized it was like a crash course, very much information, but I do hope that you got some of it, okay? Yeah.